Okay, we're going to get uh, started back up where we left off, I believe, on immunity. Um, so I realized in the previous video, and I'm sure it was the other videos as well, that you couldn't see my laser pointer. So my hope is that now you can see it the way I'm recording it now. Hopefully it shows up. Um, so we're going to introduce immunity. Um, we'll talk about the, adapt, uh, the innate immune response, the nonspecific defense systems associated with the immune system. We'll talk about the barrier defenses, and then we'll also talk about inflammation and fever. So when we talk about immunity, what we're basically talking about is our body's ability to resist disease. Um, we are constantly, since the day we're born to the day we die, are in a constant battle and struggle dealing with different things um, that can lead to disease. Now, some of those things that lead to disease include pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, yeast, which is a type of bacteria. All those things are considered pathogens that are disease causing agents. But you also have other things that can cause disease that can implicate and affect your immune system, but doesn't necessarily have a pathogen associated with it. So a couple of examples could be cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and things like that, where you can develop a disease, um, but it has um, doesn't have anything necessarily to do with a pathogenic cause, at least not in all instances. Antigens can be self or non-self. Where have we heard that term antigen before? So I paused for effect there. My hope is that you were thinking that you were thinking about um, an, an antigen that you may recall, and I'm going to write on here if I can, is we had our ABO blood groups, right? The A antigens are what made type A blood, A blood. The B antigens were what made type B blood, B blood. And the absence of A and B antigens is what gave us type O blood, okay? And then you also had your D antigen, right? which was associated with your RH factor. So that's where you got the positive or the negative associated with that, okay? I don't know why that showed up as an underline. Um, so antigens can be self. So a good example of the is the ABO blood groups and the D, that's supposed to be a D, not another O, um, can be considered part of your self blood antigens, okay? But all of your cells have... Um, antigens associated with them. They're the ones that are basically saying, you know, hi, I'm liver. Hi, I'm spleen. Hi, I'm brain. Hi, I'm heart. Um, so we have these antigens that tell the body who it is and tells the other parts of the body, particularly your immune system, who it is. And then you have non-self antigens. Okay. So we're hearing a lot about with um, coronavirus um, and basically trying to get the body to create an immune response by targeting the foreign antigens. And so, um, believe it or not, coronaviruses also create proteins that generate antigens that our body can um, then mount an immune response against. Okay, And you were also already introduced into immune responses when we discussed um, uh, blood typing. When we talked about how when we, when we mixed anti-A antibodies with type A blood, we saw agglutination, right? You remember that word, agglutination. Agglutination is an antigen antibody immune response, okay? And it creates a clumping um, of cells in that area. And if you think about it, what would be the benefit of agglutinating non-self cells? Well, in a you know non-life-threatening receiving blood emergency uh, type of situation, it helps to slow down whatever is considered non-self or foreign. It actually inhibits its ability to move around and move about and then gives the body time to process it, break it down, and bust it up. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the complement system. So your immune system has three... Um, three lines of defense. You have your barrier defenses. So think like your skin, your eyelashes, sweat, hair. You have your second line of defense is the innate or nonspecific defense system, which involves cells. And then your adaptive immune response is the third line of defense. And that's when you get into antibodies. And that's where um, we'll talk um, in the next, um, well, actually we'll talk on Thursday about 
the B cells producing plasma cells to produce antibodies. And a lot of times when we describe being immune to something, we're usually talking about that we've we have antibodies for that thing. What we're also starting to learn is that your T cells also have memory to them, and they also can provide some of an immune response. Um, and it's just a, it's just less understood, which is why you hear people arguing about, um, you know, the uh, immunity associated with coronavirus in particular, but other viruses that um, kind of fit within the same vein. All right, so your innate defenses are what we're going to talk about today or, or in this video, and then we'll talk about these adaptive defenses when we meet live together on Thursday. The innate defenses include surface barriers such as your skin and mucous membranes, and then it also includes your internal defenses like phagocytes, think macrophages, NK cells, natural killer cells, the components of inflammation, the components of what are called antimicrobial proteins or AMPs, and then fever. Fever plays a role in part of your innate defenses. And then your adapted defenses are going to be the role of the humoral immunity or adaptive immunity with your B cells and then the cellular immunity with the T cells. And then I'll talk a little bit further about um, um, the memory components of each of these as well. All right, so let's look at the skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body and is the most important organ when it comes to acting as a line of defense. So that's why anytime you have a cut, a scrape, or a bruise, well, a cut or a gash or a scrape, you now have a breakdown in your wall that is your skin, which makes it easier for pathogens to gain entry. Pathogens can try to get in, but they're not going to be very successful. Um, those of you um, that have taken microbiology, and I know at least one of you have taken microbiology with me, one of my um, things that I always talk about is, you know, bacteria like to grow in specific areas. And the example I use is like salmonella. So you always hear like, you know, watch out for raw chicken, make sure you cook your chicken so you don't get salmonella poisoning. Well, that's primarily going to be a problem if you ingest the salmonella containing um, you know, raw chicken. But if you were to lather that raw chicken on your arms, as gross and disgusting as that sounds, you're not going to get food poisoning because your skin is not the ideal place for salmonella to grow. In fact, it acts as a barrier. It has to get into your GI tract where it prefers that um, more acidic pH um, and uh, can start to wreak havoc um, and cause some serious problems if it's not um, either taken care of by the body um, quickly or um, or if it's not treated. So the skin is our largest surface. Um, it's our largest organ. It has a lot of protective aspects. It has keratinized cells, cells that contain keratin that act almost like um, like crocodile skin. You know, it just makes it very difficult for things to kind of latch onto. You don't have ker keratinized skin on the um, the moist layers of your body. So like the way I always say this, and I said this in lab for those of you who had me for lab last semester, keratinized cells are like it, when your lips get chapped. So when your lips are normal, um, they're non-keratinized. Okay, it's stratified squamous, but non-keratinized. When they become chapped, now they're becoming keratinized. Okay, so we don't want our moist, like the insides of the mouth, you know, the anal canal, vaginal canal, we don't want those things to be chapped, right, or keratinized, but they can be because of wear and tear. Um, but uh, typically your skin, because it deals with a lot of wear and tear, is already keratinized, okay? And you also have Langerhan cells. Langerhan cells are kind of like, um, or they are, the macrophages associated with the skin, and they're kind of hanging out there, um, basically gobbling things up that might happen to get past some of these um, cell surfaces um, or some of these cells. And you might be wondering, well, how in the world can they get by these cells? Well, uh, if we're thinking about bacteria, bacteria are much smaller than your cells. Um, they're very, very small. They're microscopic, right? That's why you learn about them in microbiology. Um, even though your skin cells are also microscopic, we're talking about there's um, a size difference. So it's almost like you know, a tank rolling into, you know, um, a fenced in yard, you know, it's going to provide a barrier. But if that tank can get through, it's going to get through. And so same thing can go for with bacteria. 
Your skin also has secretions coming from your sweat glands and your sebaceous glands. They help to drop the pH, so it's like an acidic pH. Um, there's also salt in your um, sweat, um, and it also washes things away. In fact, every time you like your t eyes get watery or your tears get watery, um, or your you know if you have a good cry. <laughs> Um, you're washing away some of the bacteria that might be building up along like the eye and things like that. Your oral cavity, your salivary glands play a role in producing lysozyme. They also have lingual lipase and some other, other digestive enzymes that help to break apart um, potential um, pathogens. Your stomach has a very low pH, a pH of around one or two. Um, and think, and it's very um, difficult for pathogens that don't already thrive in that acidic pH to to live in there. You have the mucosal surfaces associated with your non-keratinized cells. So this is like just like the lips, the mouth, the anal canal, the vaginal canal. These areas, the urethra. Um, these areas are considered your mucosal surfaces. And then the other thing is your good normal flora, your good bacteria. I was actually talking with my son about this because he was um, asking or we were just talking about encouraging him to wash his hands more so than um, being dependent on only using the sanitizer when he's at school. He's like, yeah, but it kills 99.9% .9 of all germs. And I was like, yes, you're absolutely right. But it also kills the good stuff, too. Um, your good stuff, and this is another analogy I use, it's not even an analogy, it's a fact of what I tell my students in microbiology is that when your um, microbes or when, you're, um, when, you're, uh, when you have good healthy microorganisms covering your skin or your digestive tract, it makes it very difficult, almost impossible for other things to get on and in there. It actually creates like an additional barrier. It's like a free barrier and all you got to do is provide some dead skin cells, which we're doing all the time. Um, and in microbiology, when we culture plates, one of the things that you'll see is like if you have a whole bunch of stuff growing on your culture, you can't grow stuff on top of the bacteria that's there because the bacteria is eating the food that's there. And unless the other bacteria eats the other bacteria, you're not going to necessarily see that breakdown in that manner. And so it creates like a barrier. OK, so it prevents pathogens from growing. It literally crowds them out. And so that's one of the benefits of people talking about, um, you know, um, you know, using soap and water for washing hands as opposed to completely trying to sterilize your hands, which you don't do. You sanitize. But um, and then also um, why it's important, you know, not to like drink bleach or other things that might kill off the pathogens in your body. Um, bleach would be caustic anyways, and that would not be good. Um, but also the role of like prebiotics and prebiotic sprays and things like that, that kind of help replenish the bacteria. Now there might be some, um, delivery concerns, meaning that maybe the, the label claims aren't hundred percent there when it comes to prebiotics, but the meth or the, the methodology and the science is pretty sound as far as that's concerned. But the prevailing thought is that what you eat ultimately dictates what type of bacteria you have present in your body. So if you eat lots of green leafy vegetables, you're going to have a lot more of the type of bacteria that are going to break down the components of green leafy vegetables that you cannot digest the, you know, the fiber. Um, but then it's going to help you to extrapolate calcium and potassium and vitamin K and all those types of important things. So your normal flora plays a really, really important role um, and so this will just be my, um, one of the things that I practice is, um, you know, I do see, I do see patients in a clinical setting. So I do use sanitizer in between patients cause it's quick and easy as opposed to rushing over to wash my hands every time. And I, I have a very low contact practice in that, in that regard. Um, but one of the things I try and do is when I'm not in the office, I try not to use, um, sanitizer. Um, I just use, you know, I just wash my hands with soap and water. Um, and then give my, my body a, a chance to kind of replenish. Because that's the good thing about the bacteria is it always comes back. <laughs> okay, so I grabbed, this is not in your version of the slides, but I grabbed this from your book. Um, and it just shows you how pathogens potentially can enter through the nasal or oral canal. So they can come in through the nose, so you can breathe them in or through the mouth, like you eat it or even just breathing through your mouth. And then you have where you have these interactions. So the innate immunity basically starts to target it 
at the level of the, um, so right now we're just going to look at just the nasal passageway. So pathogens are entering into the nose. What are some barriers that are helping to prevent it from getting and gaining a, a deeper rooting into the lower parts of the, um, uh, or the deeper parts of your um of your tissues. Well, you have skin that acts as a protective barrier, so they get trapped and hung up on the skin. You have nose hairs that help to trap the debris as well and keep it from getting out. And then you have mucus that starts to f trap, literally traps, like a, it's almost like a, a, a mud, uh, a sinkhole that the bacteria and things get it in there. And then guess what? You trap them with some dirt and other particles, and what do you get? You get boogers, right? <laughs> and so you can remove those. You can blow your nose and you can get rid of that stuff. Notice I said remove them by blowing your nose. I didn't say any other method, but other methods also apply here. If by chance some of those critters or those pathogens get past um, this, um, these uh, first lines of defenses, the surface defenses, your second line defenses will come in and they'll start to um, do things like secrete uh, histamine from the mast cells. You'll have natural killer cells that will target the cells specifically. You'll get activation of the complement system, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, but basically what it does is it pokes holes in, um, if it's a bacteria, it pokes holes in its cell membrane and it causes it to become more permeable and causes it to get destroyed. And then you get the phagocytic activity of things like monocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages. And then after it's gone through all these you know, um, defenses, then we get to our, our, our final or third line of defense, the adaptive immune system, where now you're creating B and T cells, the lymphocytes get involved, and then we get to the point where we're secreting antibodies, and we'll talk about the role of the antibodies um, in, in one of those things. But you also know, like notice here, you notice how they're kind of clumping around this, and they'll actually try and pair up around these other bacterial cells, and they cause agglutination, which again is a immune response in which they're clumping together. So you're gonna see that associated with the adaptive immune system. This is also, and I'll mention this here, we may talk about this later in the adaptive immune system. This is also one of the reasons why um, uh, the route of entry for things like vaccines have taken place is because if you were to give the vaccine components and had someone like swallow it or have someone breathe it in or inhale it, um, the chance of it actually triggering an immune response actually diminishes significantly. Um, and so the prevailing thought is that in order to get this, the adaptive immune system, to respond um, to um, something that maybe someone would want to get vaccinated uh, for um, is designed to um, bypass all these systems, which is why they go right into the muscle or right into the blood. Um, in order to activate that. And then in the process, even that's not enough because there's still um, second line defenses associated with all your tissues as well. So they'll actually add in some adjuvants that actually stimulate an immune response. And a lot of times it's that stimulation of the immune response that creates some of the, you can either say side effects or negative effects, or even some of the localized effects of a post vaccine like thing. So like whether that's fever or soreness or redness or swelling. Um, a lot of that is because the adjuvants stimulate that, meaning that you could give someone a shot that only contained the adjuvants and no like, um, you know, no vaccine components, like no um, uh, bacterial or viral cellular components. And it would actually, um, uh, it, it would still trigger the same type of response. There just wouldn't be anything for the immune system to mount. And so the adjuvants kind of play a role with that. So just to let you know, that's why they do that. Now, I do know that I at least have heard that they give like a, um, uh, an, an inhaled like flu vaccine, I think is um, something that's done um, and uh, or at least has been done in the past. I don't know if they'll still do it um, or if it's even effective. I don't know. Um, but they need to have someone inhale, you know, the components of the flu vaccine. And then that um, is supposed to generate um, uh, some immunity in response to the prevailing flu going around. If you want to know why they have to recommend like a flu shot every year or things like that, um, if you if I um, you'll learn about that in microbiology, um, and then um, if you don't, um, just reach out to me after class and I'll I'll uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay, so let's talk about some of the cells and the chemicals that make up our innate immune system. We have phagocytic cells associated with ma macrophages and neutrophils. Monocytes also fall into this category. We have natural killer cells, abbreviated the NK cells. The chemicals we have are considered cytokines. Cyto refers to cell. And kind, I always think of like kinesiology or movement. And it kind of helps to mobilize the cells to do certain things. Interferons are associated with viral infected cells. And it's basically a way of telling the um, surrounding and neighboring cells that the cell is currently virally infected. Um, the way, and just because I forget this analogy, the way I think about this is it's kind of like, um, so I have kids, so, um, but if you um, still enjoy the art of and going out and getting free candy from strangers, trick or treating, you know that if you go up to a house and their light is on, that they're there and you can knock on their door and get some candy. But if you come up to a door and the light is off, then you assume either they don't have any candy, they're not partaking, or they're not home, okay? So um, interferons kind of act like the light is on, someone's there. Um, and the candy in this case is the virus. Um, when the light is off, no one's there. It's just a normal cell. Or, or you can flip those however you feel. But just know that the light on means something and the light off means something else. But the interferons act as um, indicators that there's a problem within that cell. And then complement proteins, as I mentioned before, the complement system just complements the different components and it actually helps to bridge the different lines of defense in order to mount um, a wave attack. So your immune system isn't just like we do this and then we do this and then we do this. It's we do this and this and this. Okay, so they kind of work together. Inflammation, um, which consists of redness, swelling, uh, pain, um, you know, uh, increase in temperature, some loss of function, um, and you have localized effects of inflammation, and then you have the global or systemic effect of inflammation leading to fever. All right, so we've seen this uh, slide before. You have your multipotent hematopoietic stem cell that gives rise to um, another pluripotent stem cell that then gives rise to your myeloid stem cells and your lymphoid stem cells. Your lymphoid stem cells give rise to lymphoblasts. Lymphoblasts then give rise to the natural killer cells, and then your B, T lymphocytes, and then eventually plasma cells. Your myeloid stem cell gives rise to what will eventually become the platelets, what will eventually become the erythrocytes, what will eventually become the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils, um, and then what will eventually become a monocyte and macrophage. Okay, so that's where um, that's the breakdown of the cells. So we already know as far as innate immunity, we're going to be talking about basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, macrophages, and natural killer cells. So the only one that's considered a lympho, uh, lymphocytic type of cell is the natural killer cell, but it's part of the second line defense or your innate um, cellular line of defense. So macrophages originate from monocytes, and they are our chief or our major phagocytic cell of the immune system. Now the only, now we're going to talk about this from the role of phagocytic cells or macrophages attacking um, pathogen cells or uh, breaking down pathogen cells. But your macrophages do a lot more than that. They actually are looking at and processing all of your cells. They're constantly monitoring. They're looking for damage. When there is damage, they will send out signals in the form of cytokines to indicate that there's a problem and to either stimulate repair or to stimulate removal. And they play an important role in that. Uh, if you've done any um, studying or learning about um, uh, um, what's called autophagy, um, a lot of times people who do like fasting or talk about ketogenic diets will talk about um, the benefits of fasting is that it breaks down worn out uh, cells quicker and it's called autophagy and your macrophages play a role with that. Um, and actually what you're what you're doing is you're breaking down um, things like cellular components without breaking down the cells themselves, giving the cells time to replenish 
the cellular components, and then you get a little bit more of a stronger, more resilient cell in the process of doing some of that stuff. So it's an interesting concept. So macrophages tend to wander through tissue spaces. Um, so some of them are called alveolar macrophages. They're also called dust cells in the lung. Um, you have macrophages that are going to be hanging out in like the liver. They're called Kupfer cells, or they might be hanging out in the brain. We call those microglia. But I always say they're kind of like the custodians of the body. They're constantly monitoring. They're, you know, they're informing and they're processing when there's a pathogen. They're informing and they're processing when there's, um, you know, uh, debris or uh, tissue is failing or tissue is breaking down. They're intimately involved in all the cellular processes. Um, if you want to, um, if you're into learning about like supplements and herbal remedies and things like that, um, you should look into some of the um, research associated with echinacea and macrophages. Um, I think if you look into that, you might find some interesting articles that just talk about some of the um, uh things that they've talked about basically how echinacea tonifies or strengthens the resilience of macrophages in and of itself so a lot of times you hear about echinacea being something that you would take as a you know to fight off a cold or something like that but in reality it's there to kind of support or the components of echinacea help to stimulate um and tone like think you know working out and getting tone um the uh the cells that make up your macrophages Neutrophils, remember, remember these are your most abundant type of white blood cell. Um, they will f die fighting off pathogens, primarily going to be fighting off bacteria, but they're also going to be elevated in anything that triggers an inflammatory response. Um, they have a variety of ways in which they can neutralize um, pathogens. They can do phagocytosis, so they can eat the um, bacteria or the pathogen in question. They can release um, degranulation enzymes in a form of what's known as a resp respiratory burst. And these things will actually kill the pathogens. The, and then they can also re um, uh, release lysosomal enzymes. So they'll do the resp uh, respiratory burst um, in the event that the lysosomal enzymes don't work. So they have a variety of different ways that they're going to try and eliminate the pathogen. And the lysosomal enzymes include um, like releasing free radicals. So basically, you, you know about free radicals can be a thing that can cause uh, certain types of cancer. And we talk about that's one of the reasons why you take um, uh, antioxidants like vitamin C. But we also can utilize those free radicals to damage cells that we don't want to be um, in the body. Um, and then also we can break down and use um, uh, and produce and use peroxide, which is a bleaching agent that helps to further oxidize and break down pathogens. Um, in fact, that's why we have peroxisomes in our cells is because when the neutrophils secrete peroxide, um, the, um, the new, um, our cells have peroxisomes that convert peroxide into water and oxygen. And so it makes it, uh, a toxic chemical into a non-toxic chemical. Um, and then the neutrophils also have defensins, which help to pierce the membranes and lyse the cell. So they have a number of different ways to break down pathogens. And if you, once you take microbiology, you realize, you know, Bacteria all come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, they have different ways that their cell membranes are made up. They have cell walls. They have all these different things that make them very different. And so we have to have, um, over time, evolved to develop immune responses um, in order to handle these things. I mean, if you think about it, our immune system and all that developed tens of thousands of years ago. Um, well before the first hospital, well before the first antibiotic was ever introduced. Um, so our bodies had to develop a way to fight off these um, infections. Um, uh, and these neutrophils and things like that made that possible. Your NK cells are granular lymphocytes. They will attack cells that lack what's called the self-cell receptor. 
So it's actually um, the self cell receptors are known as the MHC class or the major histocompatibility molecules. So you have MHC class one and MHC class two. Um, MHC class one is what says, hi, I'm liver cell, hi, I'm spleen cell, hi, I'm heart cell. Um, MHC class two usually is associated with a um, phagocytic cell presenting the components of a broken down like bacterial cell or viral component. Um, and so you could still say that those are considered self because it's the self cells that are presenting, but the MHC class one are self cells. It's their own name tag, whereas the MHC class two is someone else's name tag. It's like the tattletale saying like, uh, Ralph is over there dumping over the garbage can. Um, go get Ralph. Okay. Um, and then here's, here's Ralph's, you know, I pulled some of his hair and here it is. Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. I promise so if that's like, you're sitting there going like, what, um, I will tell you, just make sure you're also reading the book in case to help fill in any gaps, um, that in case I say something that, uh, maybe I'm glossing over too much and you need to understand a little bit better, but I don't think I am. Okay, so um, once natural killer cells identify a non-self cell, they release perforins and granzymes. They induce apoptosis, particularly in cancer cells. They also will do that in viral infected cells. And they'll also bind to abnormal cell surface receptors, um, which means that if you have a cell that's considered normal, but it has for some reason an abnormal surface cell receptor, it might target that and that could be a recipe for autoimmunity. Your natural killer cells are also what are responsible for when um, a uh, what we're trying to suppress when someone um, receives a organ for uh, you know an, or, or receives an organ from someone else. It's the natural killer cells that are constantly trying to remove that organ, which is why people who receive um, cell or receive organs are on immunosuppressants for the rest of their life. And that's why matching is so important. But even if you have a perfect match, they're still not self cells. All right, cytokines um, allow cells to communicate with each other over short distances. Like I said, um, there's a particular type of cytokine known as a chemokine um, that stimulates chemotaxis. And chemotaxis is like setting up a chemical trail for um, the cells to follow so they know where to go. Like how do, you, how do your cells know to go to your big toe if you stub it? Or how do your cells know to go to your left knee if you scrape it on, you know, outside or outdoors? How does it know? Does it just go everywhere or does it go specifically to the injury? And chemotaxis is why it can go specifically to the injury. And basically the way this works is it's like a cascade system. It just It sends out the information. The molecules are constantly pumping through the body. And then what happens when you get injured or hurt? Do you, are you usually like chill? Or do you like sit there and go like, ah, crap, you know, I, I stubbed my toe. I, I skinned my knee. You know, you might be calm about it, but your blood pressure rises a little bit. It stimulates uh, a faster heart rate and all that's good for circulating um, and getting things to where they need to go to trigger that. So you can see there's a variety of cells that secrete cytokines, endothelial cells, so like your simple squamous cells and your um, uh, associated with the uh, uh, blood vessels, your lymphocytes, macrophages, granulocytes, mast cells, fibroblasts, all those things are going to secrete cytokines, which is going to trigger um, other cells to do other things. So you can see that you get a stimulus, the cytokine producing cell, so any of these would be an example. It releases cytokines, and then the target cell then has its effect. So if that means making more neutrophils, or if that means making more lymphocytes, that would be an example of how chemokines and cytokines work together. Interferons, as I mentioned before, these are typically, or these are secreted by certain cells infected by viruses, and they tell neighboring cells and protect them from becoming infected. So you basically, it acts as like a warning symbol or like I used as the example, turning the lights on to indicate trick-or-treating is allowed here and then turning the light out to indicate that no trick-or-treating is to occur here. So if you want to use the lights out version of this, it would tell you to stay away from that house. And that's essentially what the interferons are doing is they're alerting the neighboring cells 
And then what they're also doing is they're sending out their own chemokines and cytokines in order to prevent and um, inhibit replication of the virus, basically preventing it from gaining entry to a surrounding cell. It's pretty neat how our immune system allows us to do that automatically. Um, so like it says here, it binds to surface receptors on neighboring cells. It'll activate a second messenger system within. The second messenger system within just means that the things inside the cell that turn on um, sometimes it's hormone production, sometimes it's cytokine production, um, sometimes it's further interferon secretion and production to, again, create a cascade. Um, uh, you've heard the second messenger system in biology. You heard about cyclic AMP and the G protein and all that kind of stuff. That's what the second messenger system is, if you don't remember it. Um uh, so it, it alerts cell synthesis, various proteins that defend it from infection by breaking down viral genes or preventing replication. So it almost turns off DNA and RNA replication as part of that. So you can see, you know, a virus comes in, what's associated with that virus, then we start to produce interferons, and then now we're going to try and um, get the neighboring cell to produce more antiviral proteins, antiproliferative proteins, immunomodulator activities. And they even, um, now they make medications that help to stimulate this process as well. All right, the complement system. Complement system consists of 30 or more proteins that make powerful contributions to nonspecific resistance and specific immunity. Your complement proteins are synthesized mainly by the liver. And then once it's produced by the liver, it circulates into the blood in its inactive form. Um, and then it becomes activated when a pathogen is present. And when it becomes activated, it triggers multiple strategies for destruction of that pathogen. It will enhance the effects of inflammation. It will trigger phagocytosis due, via opsonization. And what opsonization is, is it looks very similar to what you saw earlier. So let's say this is my bacterial cell. And this is floating around. And while these complement proteins that almost look like immunoglobulins, and what they'll do is they'll actually stick to it and then make it easier for something like a macrophage to come in and find it. Okay. So this is my macrophage, this is my bacteria, and then this is my opsonization um, protein. So I'm just going to write the OP here. Okay, So it actually helps to bring it in. So they'll actually have a bunch of them, and then your macrophage will be like, ooh, candy. And it goes after it and breaks it down. So it stimulates phagocytosis. And then opsonization... Um, also, um, when you get the complement protein activated, it creates what's something called the membrane attack complex. And basically what that does is here's my same bacterial cell. And what it does, it's like um, it creates like almost like a laser beam, if you want to call it that. And it's there. It literally just oops. OK, that's not what I thought was going to happen. Oh, here's what I want. OK, so here's my bacteria. OK. And what it's going to do is it's going to create these holes in the bacteria. So you can see I'm kind of drawing in the lines here. And if I create enough holes, what then can happen is now we can get stuff start to enter in here to cause the cell to rupture and to burst. Okay. It's kind of neat how that works. Um, so there's a variety of different ways. I'll have you look in the um, in the book um, about how that works. You can see that you know there's a variety of different complement proteins. They're just called C1, C2, C3, C4. Don't get those confused with you know your cervical spine. Um, but all these things kind of work together in a cascade of events to trigger either the activation of the membrane attack complex. They trigger opsonization. They stimulate um, activation of the um, uh, this is actually an example of how they're utilizing and triggering opsonization. Um, and then they also will stimulate an inflammatory response. Basically, we have a whole bunch of things that work in almost like a, in a cascading event 
meaning that if this happens, then we're going to go ahead and activate this. And if that happens, we're going to go ahead and activate this. And if this happens, we're going to go ahead and activate that. When we do that and we create that cascade, we get this overwhelming immune response to take care of the pathogen. Because how long do we want to let that pathogen take hold and start to replicate? We don't want it to do that at all. So we want it to attack it now. And that's part of immunocompetence. All right. Inflammation. Inflammation is local, a local response, typically to tissue injury, and that can be any kind. It can be trauma, it can be infection, doesn't matter what it is. So this looks like a big toe, um, uh, it looks like an infection, but you could also see that same redness and swelling if this person had stubbed their toe, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I always hate looking at pictures of toes. I think they're gross. Anyways, uh, <laughs> What is the general purpose of inflammation? Well, it helps to promote blood flow to that area. So it helps to actually um, prevent the spread of pathogens. It helps to dilute the pathogens and it helps to destroy the pathogens. It also helps to remove the debris from the damaged tissue that has occurred in that area. And it'll help to initiate tissue repair. So inflammation is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a very good thing as long as it's considered acute inflammation and it does its job and then it's done. Chronic inflammation, where you have inflammation that lasts months to years to decades and more, now we have a problem where the majority of chronic inflammation, it's very difficult to understand the underlying cause. So the inflammatory response consists of five cardinal signs. They are redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss or impairment of function. Think about if you've ever twisted your ankle, you know, did it hurt? Yeah, you had some pain. Did it start to swell? Yeah, your shoe started to feel tight. You touched it. It was hot. It was red. Could you walk on that twisted ankle? Not really. And that's a way to remember that. Um, in some classes that I teach, um, I usually, I'll also ask you to know like the Latin versions of this just for, you know, just for fun, I guess. Um, so the rat, the Latin derivative, and I'll write these out. Redness is rubor. I don't know why it's uh, creating these extra. So it's R-U-B-O-R, -R, rubor. Heat is calor, C-A-L-O-R, like calorie, calor. I don't know why it keeps adding these extra lines. I apologize. Swelling is tumor. So T-U-M-O-R, tumor, or tumor. Uh, pain is dolor. So the, uh, the Spanish word for pain is duele. So that's a way to remember that. And then impairment of function is functio. Lesa. Okay. All right. Give me one second. Still checking on my recording here. Okay. It was telling me that there was no audio but that's untrue okay so one of the primary things that the inflammatory response is going to do and why we get um, swelling is because it promotes edema so tissue injury releases cytokines and chemokines these cytokines and chemokines um, trigger um, vasodilation so the blood vessels open up it increases blood flow to the area blood is hot Blood is red and blood causes swelling. And that helps to um, un helps you to understand what causes those, um, at least the first three um, cardinal signs of inflammation. Redness, swelling, and heat are all a component of vasodilation. Now, when the blood vessels vasodilate, a neat thing occurs. So this is, let's just say this is your normal blood vessel. When we cause vasodilation, we actually make the cells in between. So here's the cells in when it's tight, you know, when it's, you know, they're like layered on top of each other. They're very tight. But over here, when it vasodilates, it actually creates these gaps in the cells. And what it does is it makes the cell more permeable so we can get more clotting proteins, complement proteins into the tissue from the blood vessels. So vasodilation is very, very important in the inflammatory response. So with that increased vascular permeability, so it makes them more permeable, makes the blood vessels more leaky, 
And then we can get clotting factors, antibodies, complement proteins all get pushed into that area because we've basically removed the barrier. That leads to local swelling. That swelling then will push on nerve endings, and that is where we get our fourth component, which is pain. Um, and pain can also lead to loss of function. So we covered all the components of inflammation. Pain will also occur because bacteria can be releasing toxins. Um, your cells will release prostaglandins and kinins, which are both responsible for pain and thermoregulation. Um, and then we'll also get the recruitment of phagocytes to clear the area of pathogens. So that includes both neutrophils and macrophages. And I'll tell you this as a side note, if the tissue doesn't have macrophages, the tissue won't heal. So neutrophils are important, but if they're not there, the body can still heal. Macrophages must be present in order for the tissue to heal um, in the area that's been damaged or inflamed. So we have to have macrophages. All right, the last two slides here on fever. Now I am going to edit this slide a little bit, okay? Because it says an abnormal elevation. It's not abnormal, okay? Um, it's a completely normal function of the body um, to have fever. In fact, if we didn't have fever, we would have lots of other problems because we wouldn't have another way to limit um, the spread. Now, can you have fever patterns that can become considered abnormal or have a fever of unknown origin and that it, it could cause problem in the body? Yes. But for all intensive purposes, fever is a perfectly normal, natural thing in which the body elevates above normal or resting body temperature in order to achieve certain things, such as recovering from trauma, um, breaking down bacteria, uh, lead and viral lead infections. Um, there could be certain drug reactions and brain tumors where we could say, okay, those are abnormal elevations of body temperature. But when it comes to just fever in general, trauma infections, we expect to see that. In fact, you're going to see an elevation of body temperature just because you exercise or work out. That would be considered normal. It wouldn't necessarily be considered a fever at that point, but fever is a normal response by the body. Um, but there are some abnormal circumstances like drug reactions and brain tumors that could cause um, uh, unwanted fevers or, or um, abnormal fever patterns. We'll just, we'll leave it at that. So, this sentence down here is a little bit more clearer. Fever is an adaptive defense mechanism that elevates our metabolic rate, metabolic activity. We're going to burn through. Um, if you think about it, if you've ever had a fever, you probably also felt pretty tired because your body is basically breaking down proteins and amino acids in order to generate um, fever. You're also shivering and you're producing heat and you're squeezing and your body's trying to um, do everything it can to um, kind of keep the fire burning, but also to accelerate tissue repair. Um, fever also promotes interferon activity. Remember, we use interferons to help to inhibit um, viral replication. It also will inhibit the reproduction, reproduction of bacteria and viruses. Bacteria in particular have a certain range in which they can thrive in, um, certain temperature range and if you remove or you put that temperature too high um, we don't want to ever try and drop our body temperature too low but if we bring it too high then the bacteria can't replicate and it gives the immune system a chance to respond also uh, a, a fever a healthy fever actually helps to stimulate the other components of the immune response in order to get your body to um, uh, in order to help your body um, fight off whatever it's fighting off. So typically the receptor involved with the fever response is some sort of injured tissue or the phagocytes. The integrator, which is the chemokine being released, they're called pyrogens. So pyro sounds like fire. So we're generating heat and then it's going to trigger the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is where you keep your thermostat for your body temperature. And if we need to raise that body temperature or bring it back down to normal, it's the hypothalamus that tells the body what to do. And then you can see here, you have injured cells that start releasing the chemicals. Then after a period of time, sometimes hours, you get a fever. Okay, that fever maintains until 
the cells stop releasing the chemicals, okay? And then we go back down. So sometimes you might spike a fever in a matter of, you know, a couple of hours. Sometimes it could last a couple of days. Ultimately, it just depends on what's causing or what's inducing that fever um, when we're talking about like uh, a pathogen in this instance. And another slide that you don't have, I grabbed this from my pathophysiology um, notes. Um, it just shows you the different ways that the body um, kind of how this works out. So um, you have um, PGE2 stands for prostaglandin endothelial cells uh, or prost uh, they're prostaglandins, but they're basically fever producing cytokines that are secreted by the variety of inflammatory cells that we just discussed. And what they do is they tell the hypothalamus to raise the temperature up. So let's say we have it set at 98.6. It's going to say, let's set it up to 101.8. Okay. And so your body is going to do a whole bunch of things to raise the temperature. It's going to cause your blood vessels to vasoconstrict. So you'll start to feel like cold in your extremities as your core gets warmer. You might shiver a little bit, right? Um, your hairs might stand up on end. We call that piloerection. Um, you get increased metabolism. So you feel that when you're shivering, but then your body is constantly like breaking down um, cellular components because it can use amino acids to kind of generate more heat. So we do all these things to generate this core temperature, and we get up, and once we, and as we're reaching that point, we are said to have a fever. Once we've reached that fever and the core body temperature reaches that new set point, then we stop getting the a response from the inflammatory cells, and now we have to bring the body down, and we have to cool it. And so what are some things that will happen when we're cooling? You might see some vasodilation, meaning that the face, you might see like flushing in the cheeks, redness in the cheeks. They might be sweating. So if you've ever had a fever break and you had just like just pouring sweat, a lot of that means that you're starting to cool off again. Um, and then you're going to also see increased ventilation because the fever has released. So, okay. So <clears throat> if you have questions, make sure um, you're reaching out and telling me. Um, I will, you and I, or we will go through the um, adaptive immune response in class together on Thursday. And um, again, if you have any questions, make sure you let me know. And I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day, night, or whenever you're watching this. All right, take care.